May this day find you at peace and leave you with hope. I am Condor Sears, and it is my pleasure as the president of the board of the American Ethical Union to welcome you to today's All Societies platform. I also extend a special welcome to our presenters and guests from YVOTE, a youth-led civic mo movement. It is truly encouraging to see this type of cross-generational work and engagement being shared across ethical societies. To open today's platform, I would like to share a poem by the former National Youth Poet Laureate, Amanda Gorman. It's from her book called um, Call Us What We Carry, a collection born out of the collective trauma of the last few years and an inspiring look forward to our shared future. What We Carry. As kids, we sat in grass, fished our hands into the dirt. We felt that damp brown universe writhe, alert and alive, earth cupped in the boat of our palms. Our eyes waxed wide with wonder. Children understand, even grime is a gift. Even what is mired is miraculous. What is marred is still marvelous. Ark, a boat like that which preserved Noah's family and animals from the flood. The word comes from the Latin word arca, meaning chest, much like the Latin word arcari, to close up, defend, or contain. Ark can also mean the traditional place in a synagogue for the scrolls of the Torah. That is to say, we put words in the ark. Where else to put them? We continue speaking, writing, hoping, living, loving, fighting. That is to say, we believe beyond disaster. Even endings end at the lip of land. Time arcs into itself. It is not a repeat, but a reckoning. Days can't help but walk two by two the past and present, paired and paralleled. It is the future we save from ourselves for ourselves. Words matter for language is an art. Yes, language is an art, an articulate artifact. Language is a life craft. Yes, language is a life raft. We have recalled how to touch each other and how to trust all that is good and all right. We have learned our true names, not what we are called, but what we are called to carry forth from here. What do we carry if not what and who we care most for? What are we if not the price of light? Loss is the cost of loving, a debt more worth every pulse and pull. We know this because we have decided to remember. The truth is one globe, wonder flawed. Here's to the preservation of a light so terrific. The truth is there is joy in discarding almost everything, our rage, our wreckage, our hubris, our hate, our ghosts, our greed, our wrath, our wars on the beating shore. We haven't any haven for them here. Rejoice for what we have left behind will not free us, but what we have left is all we need. <clears throat> we are enough, armed only with our hands, open but unemptied, just like a blooming thing. We walk into tomorrow carrying nothing but the world. I would now like to introduce Christian Hayden, a trained ethical culture leader, a community educator with Women Against Abuse, and a burgeoning documentary pho photographer and filmmaker. Christian. Good morning, my name is Christian. Thank you for the introduction, Kondra. I wanted to say, begin by saying, you know, we are of the world and there are many things happening in the world today. Happy Easter, Ramadan Mubarak, and happy International Transgender Day of Visibility. I wanted to start by um, kind of a, a reflection. A, a few questions that have been churning in my mind as we think about and we sit in the Sunday. One of the things is what change in the world did you, we, yearn for in our youth? 
it's something that as I've looked back on the music I was listening to and kind of trying to remember and put myself in a place of almost myself over 20 years ago. It's a very strange thing to say for me, but it's something I feel is important to try to remember. I think often who, what the person I was, that young Christian, what he would think of me. And what kinds of insights and reflections that we were struggling with at that time and what have they become and what, you know, he would say to me, would you say, good job? Or would he say, what are you doing? Uh, but I offer that and I offer an, an invitation also, because I also think that the, we are here and we are dealing with and seeing the manifestations of things that started off very small at one point. I'd say the seed, right? Of a lot of the things that we are, we are witnessing, whether it's like from social justice, social change, um, things of self-development, right? They started out as a seed, something very small, just an idea. And I think about what are the seeds we're, we are nurturing? What are the seeds you are nurturing? What was that small that, that began as a seed? What was that small but meaningful idea? And I also want to ask, what, do you, what are ways that you've watered that seed? What have you done to realize, to grow that seed, to sprout? And as that seed has grown and sprouted, what is it that you want to contribute? What is it that that seed has contributed to the world? as it's become itself, the care and intention, what has been, been reaped? One of the seeds for myself that I remember is the seed is the, the idea, right? That being active in the world, that building relationships, that Continuously learning was a was a way to realize a better life, a way to be in the world that felt right. And so it was just an idea. It was just a seed. I didn't know. I didn't have anything else to go off of uh, until I, you know. But that seed was inspired by witnessing young people in a service learning program in Philadelphia. And I watched them on Saturday mornings learn about a social issue. I watched them form connections in this sort of, in this little temporary community. And then take that and explore unknown areas to them in their city. And finally make some attempt to improve their community. So seeing that left me with a seed that, oh, like, for young people, this feels like a spiritual experience. And so for me, this could also be a spiritual experience. So I decided, what does it look like? To I tried to figure out what it might be to, to foster that, to realize that. And I feel like I watered that seed every time I walked into the Philadelphia Ethical Society, the New York Society for Ethical Culture, the Baltimore Ethical Society. Every time I went to a Future of Ethical Societies conference and I terrified Julia with my driving, I think about the many retreats to New Jersey during leadership training and the ways that that watered that seed. And now that seed, I feel like has bec it ha I can only describe it as a vine that has stretched and weaved and connected to with so many amazing people, leaders, have Hugh Taparales, lay leaders, friends, I'll mention Julia again, Anya, other folks who seek to do good in the world, who have taken the time and reflection 
that we have we 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 worked with together and moved it into the world. And we still feel even as distance and time and a pandemic, I still feel close to these folks from this time. So I wanna go back to those questions. I wanna offer the chat as a place to put in some of those answers to those questions. What seeds have you been watering? What's some idea that began small? So y'all could share. Um, I think the chat is a better idea because there's actually 124 of y'all. So I feel like it would be too chaotic for all of you. Um, joy, humility, and heartbreak. Right. Community, thank you. Welcoming refugees. Compassion, justice, peace. Thank you. Human connection. Thanks, Julia. Feminism and safety. Courage. My favorite seed that I've watered is working with young people to create. Thank you so much. And we're going to hear more about that today. Self care, important. Forgiveness. Yes, yeah, self awareness. Expression. Hey, Joanna. Trying to learn how to listen and speak. Human rights, diversity, the environment, self-compassion, volunteering. Choosing to honor worth. Oh, thank you all for sharing. And, the, the, and so in that time, the experience of our youth, right? And I think of like going back to that question, and I'll actually ask that question because I think we should share this. What change in the world did you yearn for in your youth? So it's folks, because I heard this, this is a beautiful testimony from Daniela from taking a, a really traumatic experience and molding that into something, into working against prejudice. Yeah. A just society, animal welfare, as young people, world peace, greater human rights. I know when me, I felt my first kind of sign of injustice was the unfairness of the, the, the disparity in education that depending on where you lived and who you were, what that meant and how that could impact the rest of your life. So. Definitely education, uh, equal, equal access to education for me. More autonomy, eradicating violence, empathy, world peace, abolishing misogyny, breaking down barriers. Thank you all. Belonging. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for sharing with me. Uh, and, and also, I hope you were able to, to glean and see from the small things that people are able to share in this format. Um, what does it mean to be American? Um, Being an American means that I can truly be myself in any way that I feel fits. Using your opportunities and your privileges to help others that don't have the same as you. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, to believe in the fact that you deserve to be here. I think being an American is an, is an experience. It's the community that you build here. What it is is to interpret the laws in your own way. Americanness is a decision to a certain extent. We the future. So we have a big say in what's going on right now. I think that more young people should vote because it's important that everyone has their views heard. When I hear the, the classic thing of like, my vote doesn't matter, and I respond to them and I say, well, what's something that you care about? 
Immigration is an issue that's really close to my heart. I am really concerned about education in New York City. New York has the most segregated school system in the United States. I hate the idea that people just simply can't afford to take care of themselves. You know, everyone deserves to have health care. I think civic engagement means being able to recognize the issues that are going on in your community and connecting that to a reason why you would want to vote. Young people are sharing our ideas all the time, getting connected with each other all the time, organizing all the time. Because we have all this access to information, we've been able to use it to understand causes that we are passionate about and to actually work to make a difference with them. My generation, I feel, is really steadfast in making sure that the changes that we want are seen. There's something so magnetic um, about, I don't know, adolescents right now. We're allowed to have different opinions. We should collaborate on the best solution. I want to see everybody together as one. I want to see everybody passionate about the same thing, and I want to see everybody trying to get to the same place, the same goals. I feel like now people are actually taking us seriously, and they're actually seeing the work that we do and the work that we put into and how serious we are about making a change for not only our generation, but for the future generations to come. There are young folks that I see in my day-to-day -day life that are really making a difference, and they're pushing back on this narrative that we are apathetic, and I think that we really aren't. We really do care, and it's a matter of making sure people are listening to what we need. Hello everyone, my name is Audrey Kindred and I run programming for youth, children and families at the New York Society for Ethical Culture. Here I am in my wild office with all the things that, um, that we teach from um, and with. And I wanted to say that um, the questions that just came up in this video are core to our morning. We are looking at how supporting youth voices in a growing democracy is essential. And it's an ethical value that we hold very dear to make sure that those voices are not undermined, are not ignored, and are not seen as somehow younger than, meaning smaller than, no. These are, youth are mighty leaders in our world and they always, for all of history have been. How we um, co-generationally partner, youth, elders, um, parents, families, children. This is the big question of how we create community and how we create an engaged and inclusive democracy, both in our communities and in our larger worlds. So one of the things that we've done here at New York Ethical is we've looked to our larger city to see that ethics, ethical endeavors are happening all around us. And education of youth and support of their voices is one of the greatest places to discover that. And we have partnered with a number of youth organizations to grow ethics to grow ethics on earth through supporting these youth endeavors that has uh, been broad ranging for us. Um, we support Fridays for Future as they create the climate marches that share concerns in the world, um, including one that's coming up on April 17th. We um, have hosted workshops with Rytopia, um, where they have uh, partnered youth with elders to learn more about the civil rights movement. We have partnered with um, the Gandhi King Season for Nonviolence, hosting hundreds of youth in, quote, the house that Felix built. That's Felix Adler, our founder, and we are in the founding building of ethical culture. So we love to bring youth in and really um, let them know that this building was built for their voices, for their amplification, for their learning and yearning. And so um, we also have deep, deep seeds for our ethical um, aspirations of supporting youth. Ethical culture was part of starting or actually the seed of ethical cultures um, youth 
endeavor is called the Encampment for Citizenship. And that is a camp that has happening this summer for youth in Montgomery, Alabama. And I just am giving it a shout out to say the Encampment for Citizenship is welcoming applications. And it's one of our sort of oldest um, seedlings that um, was planted for really supporting youth voices. One of the great um, youth organizations or youth endeavors that we have come to partner with in the last two years is, was brought to our attention first through, um, through a member named Eleanor Kaplan. And she came to me as the youth director and she said, you've got to, you've got to learn about this endeavor, it's amazing. So I called up this director, Sanda Balaban, and I said, tell me all about it. What are you doing? And that's what we're here this morning to learn about is the organ, what she, what she put on earth, what she grew with um, by, by collaborating with young people to found an organization called Next Generation Leadership and Why Vote. Why vote, of course, asks the question, why vote? And answers it with the letter Y to represent youth. We are um, welcoming Why Vote today um, and learning about this amazing um, organization and this web of humanity, of growing humanity in um, in our midst, and we're so proud um, to be a house of ethics that can house the endeavors of this um, of this organization. So I'd like to introduce you to Sanda Balaban, and you know, I was going to do it in an impromptu way to tell you um, just how cool she is and how amazing it's been to witness her workshops. But actually, I would like to read to you her her bio because it's in itself speaks volumes. So Sanda is passionate about helping young people connect their interests and belief with how they can make a difference at and beyond the ballot box. In response to the complex times we're living in, the vulnerability of democracy being demonstrated and the desire to support young people in, be, in being on the front lines of change. She co-founded and directs Next Generation Politics and Why Vote, aiming to help equip the leaders of tomorrow for roles and responsibilities as citizens shaping a more just wor world. She also helms FLIP, which stands for Future of Learning and Innovative Programs. Uh, cons FLIP Consulting, through which she supports organizations in boosting their efficacy and exploring new programmatic frontiers. She has held leadership roles in education and youth development for over 20 years in the public sector at the New York City Department of Education, in educational philanthropy at the Ford Foundation and the Goldman Sachs Foundation, and in nonprofits including Facing History and Ourselves, the Boston Private Industry Council, and the Teachers Network. Her experiences teaching high school humanities in New York City and Boston deeply inform her thinking. She is a graduate of Swarthmore College and Harvard Graduate School of Education. It is my great honor to introduce her and she will bring in her youth collaborators to share a morning of learning about youth as leaders in our democracy. Thank you so much for that uh, lovely and generous, uh, typically generous uh, introduction, Audrey. Uh, I don't think there's anything further to say to introduce myself other than to thank uh, Ethical for truly opening its doors uh, to Why Vote and to democracy. It's incredible to be able to host our annual democracy camp, which you'll hear more about uh, in this workshop, uh, and our monthly afternoons of action at a place like uh, ethical culture that has such a rich history of cultivating and amplifying ethics. 
Uh, so it is my great privilege to uh, pass the mic to two of our extraordinary youth leaders, Anana and Sonia, who will introduce themselves. Um, and you will come to see why it was so important to create a youth-led organization uh, that, again, puts the, the why in both ways uh, into voting. So excited to pass to Anana and Sonia. Hi, everyone. I'm Anana. Um, and thank you, Audrey and Sanda. And really, thank you, Sanda, for bringing Vivo into this world. It's been incredible. Um, so yeah, I'm Anana. I'm 17 years old. And I go to I'm a senior at Queens Gateway to Health Sciences in New York. And yeah, sorry, in New York. Um, and honestly, I just want to talk about why vote for a little bit. Um, why vote is, if I could describe it in a word, a why vote is essentially a family to me. I came into the Changemakers program in 2022, the Summer Changemakers Institute, not knowing that much about politics and really just taking everything I learned from AP Gov in my sophomore year and trying to understand my role as a young person um, in our democracy and how I can like make tangible influence with uh, who I am and working with others. And so joining YVOTE has offered me that great platform to discover and learn new things about myself and supporting uh, who I am and my leadership capabilities. Uh, YVOTE offers so much to young people and there's so many things that I've participated in at my time in YVOTE that years ago, I probably wouldn't see myself doing at all. Like for example, I'm part of my vote speakers bureau, which really um helps me train to, which really helps me with training um how to talk to the media and how to appropriately respond to interview questions and really just making me feel confident about my public speaking abilities. And I'm also part of the social media creator corps. So we basically run uh, YVOTE's Instagram account for like a day every uh, week. And I've learned so much about which news outlets to really um, trust and condense information to make it digestible about social issues or what's happening or happening around our world to young people like us. And just being a part of YVO and navigating through all these issues that we want to seek change in and recognizing the power in our voices. That's really what a lot of what YVO does and embodies. And I'm so glad to be a part of it. And I can pass it on to Sonia now. Hi, everyone. And thank you, Anana. My name is Sonia Abel, and I'm also 17 years old and a senior at Brooklyn Technical High School. And I've been involved with Why Vote for almost two years now. And I also just want to talk a bit about my story with Why Vote. Um, I've always been someone who's cared about politics and civic engagement, but I think I felt how a lot of my peers felt in that I was overwhelmed by the amount of news headlines and social media posts and information about the political issues that I cared about. Um, and that led to me struggling to understand how I should take action and what I should do about um, how much I cared about these issues because I didn't have a community to discuss them with or um, yeah, to bounce ideas off of. And finding Why Vote was um, really a saving grace for me in that way because I was able to meet with a diverse group of young people um, who have grown to call my friends and as an honest side of my family um, and discuss these issues that matter to me, the impact they have on my life and the data and news stories about those issues um, and parse through all of that information and come to conclusions and take action um, and really become a civic leader in my own right, which has really just been so exciting um, and a journey that I've seen a lot of other Y voters go on as well. So I can't emphasize enough how grateful I am for the opportunity to participate in Y vote and for Sanda's leadership in Y vote as well. So I'm really excited to be here with you all today and to tell you a bit about our work and yeah. We're going to go into our presentation, but I just want to take a moment to um, to amplify what uh, Anana and Sonia have shared, as well as the the voices that you heard in that video, which are Y voters uh, from the past. 
um, we were going to ask you in a in a cascade, and we will have a cascade a little later, what you feel young people can contribute to shaping ethical or political culture in the U.S. I think that will become very evident, uh, even more evident than you already know uh, through the course of, of what we shared today. So, Drork, you'll notice Anana and Sonia with your sharp eyes. Uh, this was taken at a Y Vote meeting about a month ago. Next slide. Okay, so um, Gen Z is a very politically active and engaged generation, as I'm sure you were able to see in the video we just watched. Um, members of our generation really care about politics and political issues. Um, however, um, young Americans report being less likely to vote in 2024 than they did in 2020. Um, and there is a and Gen Z cites this lack of information about candidates, issues, and the voting process as a really big barrier that prevents us to be able to participate in civic engagement. So even though we care a lot about these issues, we're not necessarily always equipped to take action on them. Can go ahead to the next slide. This is especially evident in New York City um, and across the country, but for Why Vote, which um, is in New York, we're interested in how this manifests in our city specifically. And despite rising voting rates among Gen Z nationally, um, there still are low voter turnout rates um, in local elections. So New York City City Council and other state legislature elections, um, there hasn't been this high turnout. In 2021, only 11.1% of New Yorkers aged 18 to 29 voted, even though the citywide voting rate was 23.3%. So we're really um, kind of shocked and upset by these numbers. And that's um, what Why Vote focuses on in our work is trying to change that number, try to get um, youth voting rates up to at least as high as the general voting rate of the city. Um, and so despite the availability of pre-registration for 16 and 17 year olds, only 5.2% of eligible New York City youth are pre-registered. Um, so we're very concerned about all of these different data points and interested in what we can do to help um, address them through our work. Next slide. So there is definitely a root cause to why our pre-registration registration rates are so low. So while we do have 76% of young people nationwide believing that our age has that power to create change, only six, I mean, sorry, 60% of that population and especially 66% of youth of color don't feel as though they are qualified enough to participate in civics and in politics. And there is there are so many reasons as to why our civic engagement rates are so low. And a prominent factor of that is because of that access and that inability to immerse ourselves into politics and our civic culture. Uh, next slide. So are our statistics really that surprising when 30% of US youth don't have that access to high quality civic education or schools because civic literacy doesn't tend to be prioritized enough and rather trivialized. While we have $50 spent on STEM education by the federal government, there's only five cents compare, um, in comparison that's being spent on civic education. And I know I'm not the best at math, but um, $50 in comparison to five cents is a huge gap. And um, with that being said, there's so many disparities as to why um, youth don't feel as though they're qualified enough to participate in politics because all, because civic education isn't prioritized enough in our educational curriculums and some teachers might not teach it adequately enough with the with this idea of um, not teaching without sorry not teaching with depth or teaching with meaningful relevance to our students lives and so with that with that there's this gap between how quality civic education isn't accessible, and especially with school funding and the lack of access to resources or extracurricular activities that could help hone in on the way that young people feel relevant to our political system or how they see themselves represented in our um, civic climate. And with this lack of civic knowledge, we don't have that 
um, adequate education on civic rights and understanding our democratic processes comprehensively. So a lot of youth struggle to engage in a very meaningful way in these civic activities and understanding their role in activism and advocacy and their power really as a young person. And with high levels of civic knowledge, that does help with increasing voter turnout rates and registration processes because young people then get to dissect and understand um, the potency behind civic education and why participating in civic processes is so important. Our vision, uh, well, you're looking at our vision. Uh, we envision a healthy democracy where young people utilize their individual and collective power to create positive change in their communities and where every young person has a meaningful, interest-aligned civic opportunity available and accessible to them. Uh, you've probably read some of the polls about declining support for democracy. I read one recently that 57% of young of people are dissatisfied with, an America, with American democracy. That's the majority of people dissatisfied. Yet we also know, and research tells us that those who, and lived experience tells us, that those who participate civically are more inclined to support and strengthen democracy. So we equip young people to connect their passions and beliefs with how they can make a difference at and beyond the ballot box. That's really at the root of our programming is helping young people find a civic identity, a sense of agency and efficacy that they can create change in their own lives, in their communities and in the greater world. We do that by bringing together socioeconomically, racially and politically diverse young people from high schools across uh, the, the city and the country to grapple with complex civic issues and current events in order to become informed, engaged citizens and leaders within their schools and communities. Our programs focus on perspective taking, on critical thinking, and on civil discourse in order to create the generational change that our country needs. Uh, we're gonna share our four strategic goals. Next slide. Um, so, we work to expand voter and civic engagement programming for youth often excluded from democratic processes and to empower youth through experiential civics programming to strengthen democracy. Young people are not apathetic, as you can tell, uh, but they are often uninvited. We need to create on-ramps and escalators for young people to engage and demonstrate that they can make a profound difference in shaping a multiracial, multicultural democracy of the 21st century that is focused on justice, opportunity, equity, and excellence. That democracy has never existed. You know, we need to help the beautiful sort of promises and principles of democracy be reflected in the practices and the lived experiences of democracy. Young people, of course, have the most at stake, yet are often an afterthought rather than a centerpiece of democracy. We strive to shift that paradigm to put youth in their rightful place as the stewards of the future. We work to amplify youth leadership and voice within and beyond our organization. Um, as you've heard and seen this morning from the video and from youth leaders like Anana and Sonia, uh, they are incredible and need platforms, pathways, and pipelines to power so that they can lead the generational civic change that we all know we sorely need. Um, and then our fourth strategic goal is to strengthen the civic landscape to address gaps in the civic learning and youth civic leadership fields. Uh, you know, we are able to work with hundreds of young people each year directly and deeply, but we strive to impact hundreds of thousands of young people by partnering broadly with other civic nonprofits to impact the broader civic ecosystem. Uh, and you'll hear a little bit more about sort of our NYC youth agenda uh, and our NYC civic coalition with all of the youth nonprofits in New York City and we share our methodologies and our civic skills matrix, which is a, um, there were, we found that there was a lack of metrics to know what are we doing? How is it working? And also how do we make that clear to young people so that they can have a dashboard to help drive their civic engagement? And so there are 50, 50 building block skills for effective citizenship and being an informed, engaged voter that our young people 
self uh, self assess them on at the beginning, midpoint, and end of programming um, to see are they approaching, meeting, or exceeding each of these skills, and also to to call out and prioritize five to 10 skills that they really want to work on strengthening. And we believe that that is a dashboard for life, you know, well beyond their experiences in our programming. Next slide. So what do our programs at YVOTE really entail? So a really great thing about YVOTE is that our programs are peer led with the help of our adult allies like Sanda. So the agenda um, for our programs are outlined and designed and implemented by our youth for the youth. So from participants who already participated in the programs prior, they become um they enhance their civic leadership roles by becoming facilitators that help design these agendas for the youth to participate in. So at our monthly Y vote change maker uh sessions and at our days of actions, we have our facilitators guiding the youth on different activities to partake in and how to enhance their knowledge on voter on voting and um staying in contact with this political climate. And people who want to enhance their leadership skills a little further can participate in leadership tracks like the peer leader track that Sonia and I participated in to receive more training on how to strengthen and polish those leadership leadership abilities sorry and because it's peer led we have we find that a lot of our youth feel more comfortable and they transition more easily into collaborating together and understanding you know, really the potency behind like youth collaboration and working collectively as a group to create that impact that we want to see in our communities and the changes that we um are evidently always shifting into and making. Um, and a large part of why but is that our issue, sorry, our programs are issue based. So in our change makers program as well as democracy camp, we really delve into social issues that young people connect to the most and really want to be a part of when that civic chain um in this chain of civic movement and so our facilitators use issues like climate change or gender and reproductive justice criminal justice racial immigration and uh, mental health or health care we allow those we allow young people to delve into these issues and choose which ones they really want to um um, sorry, right, like connect with and take a part in, you know, harnessing how their identities um, connect to these issues. So a lot of young people would uh, this year, um, they're divided into different issue groups. And so we see these issues as lenses that we can teach civic skills and knowledge, whether it's with innovative ideas and creativity or allowing young people to research and find statistics and implications of how these issues are presented in our um, city or local government and what our policymakers and city council members and our city government are doing in in um, comparison to changing these issues and what has been done in the past. So yeah, there's so many issues that YVO allows the young people to explore and the youth to partake in. Um, and we also mentioned before that a lot of um, deterrent, deterrent uh, a large deterrent of uh, youth civic participation is the accessibility, but why votes programs and opportunities are very available um, to the youth year round. We have summer programs and we're currently in the midst of our um, spring semester program of change makers. So there's so many entry points and ways to always engage in why vote programs and even beyond why vote programs we have opportunity newsletters that are sent out every week so those who probably aren't even in their change makers program currently still have ways to engage outside of vivo and still stay politically connected and of course these programs are free there's no like um financial like barrier that you need to like pay to get in or participate in vivo it's anyone can join anyone who is passionate about political change and empowerment of young people are invited to join and a lot of these programs are stipended so there are um there is that opportunity for those who have that financial barrier to engage in these civic opportunities and participate in it next slide please 
So now that you've heard a bit about the ideas that guide our programs, I want to tell you guys a bit about what our programs actually look like, although you've heard a little bit about that so far. But you can see on the left, community engagement and partnership opportunities. Um, Why Vote does a lot with other organizations, both in New York City and beyond. Um, first and foremost, the NYC Youth Agenda, which I'm a part of, is a coalition with a few other New York City civic engagement organizations, including the Citizens Committee for Children and the Intergenerational Change Initiative. And we work together throughout the year to um, generate policy recommendations created by youth or youth about issues that we care about and to present these recommendations to New York City government officials and organizations. And this is a really big deal, not just to me, but to other people um, as a teenager, as a high school student, to be able to be in the room where it happens, talking to government officials about um, the issues that matter to us and what we want change to look like on those issues. Um, it's a really unique opportunity that I think has equipped me to going forward, engaging with politics and politicians in order to create the change that I want to see. So I'm really excited about the NYC Youth Agenda. Um, and we also are involved in workshops and trainings, um, kind of like this one you're in right now. Um, we also have a youth civic hub, which you can access online. And then we also have in the middle there, youth led out of school civic programs, um, the Why Vote Changemakers Institute, um, which has its monthly days of action at New York Society for Ethical Culture and Democracy Camp, which was also hosted at the Society for Ethical Culture this year um, and the Next Gen Civic Fellowship. Um, these are all really awesome programs that involve young people speaking to each other about our lived experiences and our political issue or the political issues we care about um, and coming to conclusions and taking action together. And then on the right, finally, you can see our youth run media production. We have a podcast called The Roundtable, which you should definitely check out. I think you can access it on Spotify and some other podcast platforms. We also have social media um, accounts, which Anana and I are both involved in, which um, you should definitely also check out. And then we also have a Gen Z blog. Um, and so one thing I want to emphasize is because we have so many avenues um, for civic learning with Why Vote, these are just nine examples, but I could come up with some more right now as well. Um, we know that uh, civic engagement, there's no one size fits all approach. Any young person who comes to Why Vote and wants to get involved um, has numerous opportunities for how they might participate in um, civic learning, depending on their strengths, their interests, their lived experience, and their passions. And so that makes Why Vote a home for people of all different backgrounds. And that's something that I think is really special about it. Um, so I think you can go on to the next slide. And we'll actually skip this uh, slide for time, but it's a great uh, sort of two minute video of our annual Civic Expo. Um, so we'll share that link in the chat. So we have all these programs out there, but how do we know that our programs are actually working and out there making a difference in the lives of our young change makers? Well, let's look at these statistics. So 29% of youth that first started our program indicated that they didn't have much civic knowledge or experience. But after participating actively in our programs, 93% of them left, you know, evaluating themselves as highly knowledgeable and experienced young people in these areas. So a large part of YVO deals with how we allow young people to gain that civic knowledge and feel confident in um amplifying their voices and empowering themselves and before even feeling empowered um in a society feeling that self-empowerment and that strength as a young leader are um within ourselves makes a large difference in how we um project that leadership outside into the world in our political culture so yeah why vote has a huge responsibility in shaping young people and becoming and becoming the change makers that they are and the change maker that lives within them. Uh, next slide, please. And one of our 
huge programs is the Change Makers Institute, which runs through the summer and our Change Makers program that is also year round with our fall and spring semester programs. So our Change Makers Institute really deals with, you know, how to make change as it's indicated um, in the name as young people. And as Sonia beautifully um, echoed before, just how to um, feel like you're represented in different as people from different communities and different demographics and understanding different perspectives of the people around us and the youth around us. There are 74% of growth and ability of in youth ability to educate people on the importance of voting. And I know I can speak from experience. Um, like I said before, I didn't have much civic knowledge when I entered Why Vote, but after participating in Change Makers Institute or being at Democracy Camp, I um, wanted to host voter registration drives in my school or taking some of the activities that we do in Why Vote and trying to um, implement them in my school's AP government curriculum for other young people to become more immersed into politics and understanding really their role and why it's so important as young people to understand their democracy and how they can shape our democratic processes. And 70% of the growth in their ability to connect with peers from different backgrounds and diverse perspectives. So like we said before, everyone in Y Vote is all from different neighborhoods, from different boroughs. So there's so much room to understand one another and understand our identities and connect with each other in ways that influence meaningful conversations and enriching change. And so um, at our Change Makers Institute, we allow young people to go through, um, sorry, to participate in workshops and in workshops and understand that there's um, so much change you can make, even though we can't vote yet, as um, a lot of us haven't are in 18 or we aren't eligible to vote um, yet, but Sonia and I will be able to vote this year. So that's exciting. But um, in the past, a lot of us who weren't in the age range, we understand how as young people, there's so much way to create space to make change, even though we can't cast our votes yet. So par by participating in these innovative projects or doing research on issues, on the issues that are embedded within our society and our cultures and um, our client, our pro sorry, political climate, we understand that there's so much to feel passionate about. And there's so much passion that we carry within us to create that change in um, towards our democracy. Next slide, please. And so we also have Democracy Camp, which runs for, I think, a week in the summer. Um, yeah, so Democracy Camp, as it's said in the name, is basically a camp that talks about like um, the foundations of our democracy and really understanding how um, our democracy today, as it is presented, we break down into the core principles of our demo democratic, sorry, democratic processes, and how the foundations of you know our past create continuities that we still see embedded today in the present, or what they mean for the future. And so, a lot of young people express like either their hope for the future, or maybe they feel a little dejected by the way things are running or how our condition of democracy is today. So with Democracy Camp, we hope to empower young people to feel more hopeful or understand that their voices do count and that they feel represented in the change that they want to make and advocating for issues that they, um, as we said before, those different social issues that Why Vote aims to project to young people, how to find solutions for those issues and advocating for yourself, for your communities and um, finding tangible ways to create that idea of making an influence in our communities, in our academic lives, in um, our neighborhoods, and creating the difference that we want to see in within our democracy as young people. So in our seven, or sorry, I don't remember, I think in our one week of democracy camp, it might sound like a short program, but honestly, it is so enriching. And there's so much that we do within a single day. 
that leaves you feeling um, rejuvenated and really stronger as a young person after doing a whole day of activism and advocacy and understanding how our past really creates the present, sorry, creates the um, change that we see in the present and the change we continue to advocate for in the future. Next slide, please. So going forward, YVO is definitely interested in expanding our work. Um, we want to expand Democracy Camp to more communities, both within and beyond New York City. Definitely stay tuned for more information about that at some point. And we're also launching a digital youth civic hub to connect New York City youth with civic resources and opportunities, which I mentioned earlier. You can check it out online. Um, but yeah, we are definitely interested in growing our work and in uh, your participation in supporting that growth of our work. You can move on to the next slide. Um, so here are some ways that you can get involved. Um, if you are a teenager or know a teenager who might be able to participate in our programs, especially in New York City, but even beyond that, um, you can follow us on social media or check out our website or any of the links that Sanda put in the chat um, for getting involved with YVOTE. Um, applications for our summer programs are open. Um, I can definitely testify personally to how um, fun, exciting, and fruitful participating in those programs is. So definitely, I would recommend sharing that information with any teenagers who you know. Um, you can also... Um, adapt and implement Democracy Camp in your community. If you check out that link on the slide in the middle, um, if you are interested in carrying our work forward to your community, we would definitely love to um, talk about that. And then also donors, you can support our programs and the national expansion of them at yvoteandy.org slash donate. Um, as Anana mentioned earlier, our programs are all free and many of them are stipended and that's only possible through um, donations. So definitely you should check out that link. Next slide. Yeah, so thank you all for listening to our presentation and hearing us out at, sorry, sorry, um, hearing us out as young people and the work that we do at YVOTE. And so we want to take this time and space to ask for any questions that you might have about our programs or what we do um, in our web communities or just any further reiterations or explanations. And Audrey and host, do we have time for questions? We do have a closing question cascade and I know we have run a little bit long, uh, but also see a question from Perry. Do we have time for any more than, well, we'll take Perry's question and then we'll see. Uh, wonderful presentation. I'm just wondering if you could give us an example of a particular issue that you've enjoyed working on or felt was uh, successful in creating change in New York City. I can go first. Um, so throughout my experience in Why Vote, one issue that I've been involved with um, quite a bit is the issue of mental health, um, which is something that matters to me personally, and I just perceive as a really pressing issue considering the youth mental health crisis in New York City and beyond. Um, and so the NYC Youth Agenda works on that issue, but Why Vote also um, has conversations about mental health within our own programming. And last year, the NYC Youth Agenda, one of our main demands related to mental health was that access to therapy for young people be expanded um, and affordable for teenagers in New York City. And in the time since that recommendation was created, there is now this program called NYC Teen Space, which allows New Yorkers aged 13 to 17 to access online therapy for free, um, which is just such exciting movement um, on that issue. And I've definitely, um, that's just one example, but I've been able to see um, that our work has contributed to change in that way. And we actually worked with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene on the naming of that program and um, what it looked like and provided um, feedback on how the program has been run since then. So that is definitely one example of how our work has been involved in actual policy change. Yeah, and I could speak about my experience. Uh, last summer, I co-facilitated an immigration justice action group um, for our Changemakers Institute. 
And there was a lot to unpack, especially with the ongoing migrant crisis in New York City. And my group and I, we created this Jeopardy game to kind of test our the knowledge of our participants on how much they know about um, the disparities and the barriers that <clears throat> migrants face in terms of education, healthcare, um, employment, and so on. And it was um, it was interesting to see how much how many questions people got wrong, which really helped with us understanding the influence we made in spreading the awareness of the realities that a lot of migrants go through um, in New York City. And so, uh, yeah, we're glad to like have opened that book of knowledge to um, young people and even adults on the ongoing barriers that migrants face. And we even talked to Andrea, who's part of the NYIC, the New York City Immigration Coalition, who taught us a lot about her work in helping um, immigrants and just how to advocate for them. And there were so many shocking, not only statistics, but just facts about how uh, inaccessible things are to migrants in terms of healthcare or like even getting basic necessities. So honestly, yeah, a lot of our work can be a very eye-opening experience. And there's just so much that I constantly learn when we're in unfolding these projects and working together to create change. Thank you. No problem. I'll, I'll just add to that, um, partly by example, um, Anana, Sonia, other Y voters have opened so many doors to have young people at decision-making tables and to really be influencing programming and policy in New York City through our New York City um, youth agenda. And we can invite you to, we're having a big policy party uh, on April 15th, no taxation without youth representation. Uh, and it's focused on building the city of the future. But, you know, we work very closely with the New York City Comptroller's Office, with the Public Advocate's Office, with various city council members and borough presidents. The New York City Comptroller, Brad Lander, actually designed a whole initiative around the work of the Environmental Justice uh, Policy Group of the NYC um, Youth Agenda and that are working to, to create resiliency hubs in every New York City school uh, with a delegation of about a dozen young people sort of really building this out. So there are myriad examples. Um, Audrey, do we have time for one more question or should we go to, we don't, okay. I'm gonna put in um, a last, well, I'm going to put in, if you'd like to get our monthly newsletter, our first Tuesday newsletter, um, you can um, do this uh, first Tuesday newsletter to subscribe. Uh, we only email once or twice a month, so you will not get bombarded. Um, and we are going to close with a, a uh, cascade uh, as we started with with Christian. Uh, so once again, we ask you to type your response into the chat, but not push send until we signify that you should. Do you want to tell read this question, Anana? Yeah, sure. So our closing cascade question is, um, sorry, one second. It's what will you carry forward to your community about youth power and the significance of youth voices in our society? That was a mouthful, so is it in, yeah, so it's also in the chat. We'll give you a moment to really synthesize what we've engaged with today, what you're carrying forward with you, which we hope you will. Has everyone had a moment to, what will you carry forward to your community about youth power and the significance of youth voices in our society? We'll do a countdown. Five, four, three, two, one. Cascade. Anana and Sonia want to share some of what you're seeing in the chat. I know they're coming in fast and furious. Yeah, I see the word hope popping up a lot, which I'm really excited about. And some people saying that they want democracy camp in their area, which is really exciting. Um, Anana, does anything else stick out to you? Yeah, um, their absolute importance or the youth being the future. I really love hearing that, um, especially since a lot of us as young people have often felt neglected that our voices 
don't really count for anything or they don't matter. So hearing you guys talk about how important we are in shaping our future and the present means a lot to us. Thank you so much. I would like to introduce a colleague in the ethical culture community. Um, in ethical culture, we have this sort of growing in um, acronyms. One is YES, Youth of Ethical Society, and then there's FES, which is Future of Ethical Societies, and that's sort of young adults, right? So a leader of FES who represents FES, the Future of Ethical Societies in our American Ethical Union is Julia Julstrom Agoyo, and she is um, she is newly a New Jersey um, resident, and we look forward to welcoming her to New York Ethical soon. Um, she uh, is a member of the American Ethical Action Team. She uh, grew up in Ethical Culture Society through the Ethical Humanist Society of Chicago. And this has led her to her current work where she spends her days as the deputy director of the Legal Center um, as part of New York City's emergency response to, for arriving immigrants. I wanna say um, thank you for your ethical work on earth and please um, take it away, Julia. Thank you so much, Audrey. Thanks for the introduction and hello everyone. Um, I'm so happy to see all of your faces and be here with you today. I'm also so inspired by the young people we just heard from. Um, as mentioned, I represent FUS or the Youth Contingent at the AU. As an active member of the AU's Ethical Action Team, I'm here today to talk about our National Ethical Action Project this year, which is Get Out the Vote or GOTV. Before I get into that, I wanted to share a bit about my perspective as a young voter. Um, I think in so many ways, this election year is so important. Uh, of course, we, I think that's been applicable for a lot of the elections recently. Um, as an ethical humanist, a human rights advocate, and a human living in the U.S., I believe voting is a powerful, necessary <clears throat> tool, sorry, in the toolbox to work towards systemic change. That being said, it is not the only tool, and I think we have to have greater empathy and really listen when young people say they are frustrated with all levels of government and that they're not, not everyone is excited to vote. Um, I'm beyond frustrated too. I'm heartbroken every day. I'm also not excited to vote either, um, especially with their choices this year, but I see it as an obligation because I have the privilege to vote and to use that vote strategically uh, whatever that means to you, which is how I personally use my vote in the primaries this year. That is why I'm excited about the Ethical Action GOTV project this year. Uh, many ethical societies have been doing this work for many years, um, and some of, that I've heard of, including Brooklyn and Austin, have already begun doing the work this year. Um, as the AU, we see our role as connecting, supporting, and amplifying society's efforts um, for GOTV. In that vein, I would like to introduce Howard Rose, who is kindly stepping in for his wife, Janet Rose, today. They both have successfully postcarded for years with NYSEC, and Howard will, will share with us about their experience and advice. Howard, can you begin by introducing yourself? Thank you. Um, Howard Rose, I'm on the board of the NYSEC and the uh, Social Service Board, and my wife and I um, run the program uh, for the Center for Common Ground, uh, Reclaim Our Vote. That the Center for Common Ground makes it very easy to participate in the Reclaim Our Vote. And as Christian mentioned in the beginning of this meeting uh, about planting seeds, the Reclaim Our Vote is planting a seed to get people to be active uh, because so many have stepped up in Manhattan. Uh, we've sent out, uh, we've assigned 20,000 addresses for the primary in Georgia and Virginia. And people ask, well, why the primary? Because when you get somebody to vote in a primary, it's much more likely that they'll be encouraged to vote in the general election. Um, since 2020, uh, 200,000 postcards have gone out to Texas, Georgia, Alabama, North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, which is really impressive. And uh, kudos to all the people who signed up. 
Um, once you set up an account with Center for Common Ground, it's very easy to, to order the materials uh, for the Reclaim Our Vote, the discounted postcards, you download the number of addresses you need, whether it's a script and a county-specific uh, label that has all the information. And you say, well, why would it work, you know, just sending out a postcard? Well, you go to your mailbox and you look and, oh, there's a bill, there's a bill. Oh, oh I'm getting a handwritten postcard that somebody took that time and it jumps out at you and it really makes it effective way of communicating with people. Um, it's a very personal message, it's county specific and it's encouraging people to bring ID and to bring uh, five friends. Um, and they can also contact to see if they're still registered because as we know, many people are being thrown off the polls. So this is a proactive approach. Um, the Reclaim Our Vote is an ideal way to encourage your community and we encourage other societies to do that. Um, and Dor will uh, drop in the address, uh, the link in the chat for Reclaim Our Vote. Uh, but I also would like to encourage all the societies to create writing parties. Uh, we've done that. We've had 25 people. We've had 50 people. And it's so gratifying and such a positive thing when everybody's sitting in a room writing these postcards. Uh, it's, it's a great way to participate, to get your members to be involved and it works out very well. Uh, Jen and I are available to advise any society that wants to get started and our emails will be in the link. So thank you very much. Thank you, Howard. Um, that pretty much summed up all the questions that I had. Um, so as Howard mentioned, uh, emails will be dropped in the chat. Hi, it sounds like somehow we lost Julia's voice on that. Um, I, I was muted, so I didn't know if that was intentional. Oh. <laughs> um, okay, so yes, uh, emails will be dropped in the chat, um, and we are all available to uh, follow up with any societies wanting to get started with postcarding. And thank you, Howard, for sharing your time and expertise with us, and thank you to all supporting these important initiatives. Um, Before we go to the next part, let me just briefly say that um, also in the chat, you will find a link for donations and um, we welcome donations um, for this program. All donations will be shared between YVOTE and the American Ethical Union um, and uh, with great, great gratitude for the presentation today. Thank you so much. Um, so if it's okay, if this is still the agenda, I'm going to pivot now and take this opportunity to invite you all to the AU's 2024 assembly. Um, I believe it's happening this summer, June 26th to 28th at the First Unitarian Society of Minneapolis in person for the first time since the pandemic began with a hybrid option as well. Um, there will be community building, food and amazing speakers. More information on the assembly website, which will be dropped in the chat shortly. Um, I have missed being physically in community with other ethical humanists so much, and I'm personally very excited for this. I'm so grateful to see how we have showed up here today with all of our societies collectively gathering, seeking meaning, seeking community, and grounding ourselves in one another's existence. Thank you for choosing to be here, and I hope to see many of you in July. Thank you all. And for the young, for the youth who joined us, and for giving us us this insight and also this model, for, um, uh, you know, creating the space for young people to be involved and are civically active and engaged and informed. Uh, I would hope for folks. What we're gonna do is we're gonna go in the breakout rooms. There's gonna be a prompt that you'll see. Mm -hmm. I hope, mm -hmm. as far as when we as we're beginning to go into these rooms that we keep a kind of like understanding that we have a limited amount of time we're running a, a little bit behind schedule and that there are many people that may want to speak so we want to balance between listening and sharing and trying to keep our uh, sharing to like a minute or less uh, per person let's go for 30 seconds aim for 30 seconds and yes, let's see. And the prompt is going to come up and I'll like repeat it. But basically, it, it involves a topic that we talked about today, which is how do we 
facilitate co-generational spaces, um, co-generational, how does our, how can our community support co-generational engagement? And so when you think about our community, you can think about that nationally, as well as our local communities and societies or wherever folks are coming in from, mm -hmm. what kind of things they can do to support that kind of engagement. I thought you just told me you were no, going to say that. Right. So you're not muted. 